Chapters twenty one and twenty two of War and Woman by Mrs. St. Clair Stobart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty one. But the world will never learn anything from women who only acquire knowledge at second hand. Argument from intellect alone is powerless to persuade mankind to action. Intellect is only an accessory of human nature, and is therefore unconvincing to the hearts of the multitude whole libraries of learned treatises on the peace movement which might have interested my intellect would never have moved the real me as this was moved by feeling the tragedies that i saw enacted everywhere in that balkan charnel house the b r c s in sending out units of men only to nurse the sick and wounded in bulgaria acted doubtless with the best intentions but they acted according to the lights of a half a century ago the purblind policy of shielding women against their will from a knowledge of truths however unpleasant these may be is disastrous not only for women but for the community at large the b r c unit which established a hospital in the old turkish barracks two miles outside kirk Kilis, performed an excellent service and major burrell r a m c who was in charge and major hudson and captain beham deserve the greatest credit for their success in carrying out a horribly difficult job they had i believe been dispatched as a unit for a field hospital and had to transmogrify themselves into a base hospital unit as best they could they made bricks without straw as british officers can but if the women of the convoy corps had not by an odd coincidence been close at hand working on parallel lines and giving testimony of british women's good will to work apart from all pusillanimous possibilities wherever work was needed the exclusive maleness of the red cross unit in the turkish barracks would have been a standing humiliation to great britain for this red cross unit of men only signified that a prominent organization in great britain is still breathing the atmosphere of the times of our great-grandmothers and fails to realize that women can no longer be content to float idly upon the surface but feel it their duty at whatever cost to themselves to plumb the depths of life for the first three weeks that we were in kirkkilis we saw nothing of the men's unit which had arrived shortly before us but eventually perhaps when rumours of our self-containedness and of the not unsuccessful nature of our work had penetrated to those turkish barracks the officers called upon us they were then very friendly and we became much indebted to their kindness in lending us from time to time their x-ray apparatus for the location of bullets they were on their first visit to us probably as curious to see how a hospital could be run by women without any men as i was to know how a hospital could possibly be run by men without any women as i was showing them round the wards in which our women were all busily attending to the patients i suggested laughingly wasn't it very brave of the men to attempt to run a hospital without women i can't believe i added daringly that your men could for instance be as scrupulous with the sterilization of the instruments in the theatre as the women or that they would understand so well how to keep their wards clean or that they would be so patient or so careful in the nursing or ah interrupted one of the officers if you would exchange some of your women for some of our men we'd bless you to all eternity but that exchange was not effected later however as christmas drew near and the stress of work in both hospitals had grown considerably less owing to the continuance of the armistice they very kindly asked us if we would care to join forces with them for dinner on christmas day we could legitimately by then allow our respective staffs a couple of hours relaxation and we accepted the proposal with gladness the commandant to whom the scheme was confided then very kindly put an automobile at the disposal of the two hospitals and told us we could drive out to any of the outlying villages where away from the main route of the army poultry etc might still be left and requisition for payment any turkeys chickens geese or sucking pigs that we could find one morning therefore two of the red cross officers and one of their interpreters an american missionary who worked in sophia called for me in the automobile and we dashed off in what journalistic headlines might not inaptly have called a british raid upon turkey farmyards in thrace were we found sensibly conducted pigs were all born grown up for there was not i was thankful to find a sucking pig in the whole country and no one at all was born a goose for there were also none of these to be found there was however as might be expected a turkey in most places our tactics on arriving in a village were as follows first we would go to the house of the commandant 
and arouse him from either his morning his midday his afternoon or his evening slumber and obtain from him permission to commandeer whatever animal we should covet next we sallied forth on foot into the village and making for greens open spaces and farmyards we would mark down any winged animals we saw so far so good but the business of tracking the owners of the winged animals was another proposition the poultry apparently had no owners belonged to a republic of their own for no bird that we ever selected ever belonged to anybody or the owner was at the front and in his absence no one had authority to sell even if eventually by jesuitry and cross-examination an owner was run to earth he was always a stranger to the place knew nothing about any turkeys or to whom they belonged and then in extremis he would finally protest that he loved his turkeys and wouldn't part from them as he had no use for money we guess this meant that guided by past experience during the war he had no faith that he would ever see the money if he parted from his birds so our next move was to jingle money in our hands ostentatiously then we would stroll casually towards the little cafe and invite our friend to come in with us and sit down and drink a glass of masticha and a cup of coffee coffee which must now be called not cafe turc but cafe balkanique during this process the ramparts generally fell but in the last resort we would threaten to take the business into our own hands and choose and kill and make off with what birds we liked and immediately the look of detached unconcern on the face of our old ruffian would give place to one of interest and the conversion of the owner into a willing seller was accomplished all we had then to do was to persuade him for his own good that a huge piece of fortune had come his way with our entrance into his village and that five francs in his pocket was of considerably more value to him than a tough old turkey cock strutting aimlessly about on the road outside and then after perhaps another glass of masticha the bargain would be struck and our only remaining job would be to catch our birds a performance needing some athleticism we collected all together that day eighteen turkeys and twenty-six chickens and we had a fine business tying them all alive oh and as obstreperous as their former owners to the top of the car but before we left the last village the news had leaked out that we came from hospitals and that the two khaki-clad officers were doctors immediately we were besieged with requests for medicines and the maimed the halt and the blind were brought to us in expectation of immediate cure for here again the results of warfare were cruelly apparent almost without exception every child in the village was suffering from complaints which were the effect of lack of nourishment the breadwinners had been on the field of battle for four months and any stock such as sheep and goats if formerly possessed had long ago been sold even flour to make the ubiquitous brown bread was hard to get a more pitiably anemic looking village full of women and children it would be difficult to find one pale-faced handsome woman was in great distress and implored us to come to her house and see her little son he had been lying ill for two weeks and she could do nothing for him we went back with her to her one-roomed hut the little fellow about three years old was lying in high fever on a mat the usual bed upon the floor with a covering of blankets he was white and emaciated had a hard hacking cough and frequent bleedings of the nose with the usual ignorance of peasants the mother had been trying to make him eat the hard brown bread and was distressed because he could not swallow it my two doctor friends told her she must procure milk and give him beaten up eggs for she kept a few fowls and send in to the hospital for some medicine next day they then went outside and administered advice and treatment to a group of women and children and old folks who had collected with a wonderful assortment of ailments for warned by a previous experience my friends had brought a medicine chest i was then requested by the mother of the little boy to squat indoors turkish style on a mat on the floor and talk to her she fixed her dark eyes full of fear searchingly upon me will he die she asked if if he were not here when when his father comes back from the war but of course he will be here if you do as the doctors tell you i answered but it all depends on you keep this kettle going we had rigged up a bronchitis kettle on the open fireplace and give him milk and eggs and the medicine which will be fetched to-morrow and he'll soon be well she was comforted and then she turned her attention to me i had to explain every item of my uniform 
where i was working and why i had come so far to help her people and then suddenly again oh but you're sure he won't die and i was glad when the doctors came inside as it was now dark to examine by a small oil wick the only available light the eyes of an old man this woman's father he had cataract and was told he must go to kirk Kilis to a hospital and have it removed it was then time for us to go and as we said good-bye the mother pressed into my hands a basket of fresh eggs Bakshish, she whispered and as i of course refused to accept it yes yes you must take them she added surprised unable to understand that the doctors could have performed a service for nothing and that we could deliberately refuse an offer of six good eggs we could only make her desist by reminding her that the boy needed all the eggs she would be able to give him if we had not all been fully occupied in our own wards there was plenty of work to do in doctoring the non-combatants in the outlying villages where medical advice was of course out of the question but we returned with our turkey-laden car to the routine work at our respective hospitals having agreed that our combined staffs should meet on christmas day at a restaurant in kirk Kilis, where we should neither of us have to be ourselves responsible for the cooking and eat our christmas dinner in comparative luxury the bulgarian christmas is like the greek and russian festival celebrated thirteen days later than that of the anglican church and our patients all grew very excited when they heard that we were going to have a kissy mass of our own early on christmas morning when i went as usual round the wards i felt the atmosphere was full of suppressed excitement and before i could pronounce my usual greeting Kaxti, how are you there was a general rustling of sheets and the patients all sitting up in bed craning forward their necks shouted triumphantly with one accord meli kisimas this they had been taught by our energetic and invaluable girl interpreters penka and adriana and the night nurses told me that many of the soldiers had spent the night muttering the words over and over again in their anxiety not to forget them when the fateful moment arrived the relief at having now safely disgorged these verbal calibans was obviously intense no english church services had hitherto been available for our staff who had contented themselves on sundays with attending the bulgarian service held in one of the greek churches but on this christmas morning a service to which we were invited was conducted in the turkish barracks by the red cross unit's american missionary interpreter this gave a realistic touch of christmas to the day a portion of both hospital staffs was of course obliged to be absent from the christmas evening dinner and remain on duty with the patients but the remainder about forty of us enjoyed at seven p m a truly memorable feast for the restaurant keeper had played up well and had kindly kept the room all day for our exclusive use in order that we might decorate it with boughs of mistletoe with which the trees around kirkulis abounded we had also for the occasion taken down our union jack red cross and bulgarian flags which were suspended on a rope across the road between the two main houses of our hospital and with these together with the flags belonging to our friends of the red cross unit the room looked appropriately festive and british bulgarian after many weeks of trek ox and of stew-pot food those turkeys took on an ambrosial flavour which no english turkey could have rivalled and the tinned plum puddings sent out by our friends from the old country were universally declared to be the best we had ever eaten the restaurant keeper had been duly coached to send the pudding in on fire but when the time came the tidings circulated that bulgarian brandy would not light we couldn't of course believe this and thought it might be a superstition on the part of our landlord but the united efforts of ourselves and our red cross messmates definitely failed to ignite that stolid bulgarian brandy our brandy is meant for drink not for fireworks explained our host as he disdainfully watched our efforts these were grotesquely futile till the brilliant suggestion was made that a little english brandy of which there was some in a flask might set off the bulgarian spirit the result was instantaneous and the puddings made their entrance in orthodox fashion surrounded by tongues of fiery flame thus not only our bulgarian patients but even the bulgarian brandy chivalrously acknowledged that a little english help was good for the spirits this impromptu interlarded in my toast to the bulgarian king and queen much pleased our bulgarian interpreters toasts and speeches were beautifully short by agreement and could not on such an occasion be utterly omitted major burrell proposed our king and queen and sang the praises of the convoy corps 
whilst i toasted the bulgarian king and queen and spoke words of appreciation of the friendliness of the red cross unit toward us i had the pleasure also of reading aloud a telegram which i had just received from queen eleonora wishing the women's convoy corps a happy christmas then after the singing of old lang syne the bulgarian national shumi maritza and god save the king we all dispersed and hurried back through the dark muddy streets to our patients some of us not unthankful that a day always full of painful memories had come to a successful close End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two now that the armistice had been in progress for three weeks and the authorities were all of opinion that the war was over and that hostilities were not likely to be renewed the question of closing the hospital and returning home had to be considered other foreign missions had already either left or were about to leave we had for some time had no fresh surgical only medical cases and if we were to remain longer our hospital must be converted into a medical hospital for typhoids and other fever patients and though we were prepared to take anything that came along amongst the surgical cases whilst conditions of war prevailed our position in the middle of the town and our lack of sanitary requirements would not i considered justify our filling the hospital with typhoids and infectious cases which need sanitary precautions we were unable to provide a serious epidemic amongst patients as well as nurses might have resulted some of our staff which was already small enough could not in any case have remained for a fresh term of work major burrell also considered the time ripe for the departure of his unit and as he and i had consulted together and had decided to act simultaneously in the matter of closing our hospitals we together visited dr kiranoff he much regretted our departure but he agreed that the surroundings of the convoy corps hospital were unsuitable for fever patients and he arranged to take over our remaining serious cases and combine them with those of the red cross unit in the turkish barracks under the charge of bulgarian doctors subsequently our own three doctors decided to remain in kirk Kilis and assist the bulgarian red cross authorities and later when the british red cross unit had departed were transferred to the turkish barracks where as i hear and can well believe they have rendered excellent service we foresaw that the news of our prospective departure would not be welcome to those of our patients who would not be well enough to return to their homes or to their regiments but would have to be transferred to another hospital we decided therefore to keep them in ignorance as long as possible but the news leaked out and one morning when at six thirty i was as usual making my round of the hospital i found one of the patients in the first ward i visited with the tears streaming down his cheeks we always called this man dobre which means very well because though he was seriously ill with a complicated fracture of the femur due to shrapnel shattering he always replied dobre dobre when we asked him how he felt just as a reassurance to us that our treatment was successful i was of course horrified to find our much-loved cheerful dobre in such condition and i asked the nurse what was the matter she told me what i had immediately guessed that a rumour had spread as to our departure and that the patients were much distressed dobre who had been taking in and understanding every word she said turned his big tearful eyes on me you're going away you're going to leave us he sobbed as i went up to him and took his hand ah yes i answered but even if we do go away you needn't be unhappy for you will be sent to a hospital where you will be quite as well cared for as you have been here in fact i added it's a bigger and a better hospital but dobre nodded in the negative no no he sobbed where we shall go we shall be looked after by fathers but you are mothers and that is much better how i wished that the b r c authorities could have heard those simple words they have now heard the story but their only comment has been if we had the decision to make all over again we should make the same decision we considered the balkans was not a fit place for white women is it not from decisions such as these made over the heads of women against the wishes of women concerning the work of women by men who have not taken the trouble even to inquire into the conditions of the work that rebellious women are created but now the fact of our speedy departure soon circulated in the wards and our patients requested our clever interpreter adriana to try to express in writing their feelings of gratitude for the work we had been privileged to do for them the following verses which ingeniously and naively interpret the sentiments of our bulgarian soldier patients for whom we on our part felt a strong affection were the result a true story 
sick and wounded we first came some near death's bridge and some lame far from dear ones far from home cold unfed here there to roam but thanks to god that was not long we have to sing thanksgiving song a group of ladies well prepared resolved war sighs with us to share they started from a far-off land we think by god they were all sent of cold and mud they never thought by working hard our life they bought a sweet home they arranged at once to see our own they gave us chance as pets we were in sister's hand with joy their cause we will defend so kind and true they all have been we thought our dear ones we have seen and now they gone will not forget as rose the sun when it has set we wish to thank but find no word but god has seen and knows has heard he may give you double share for your kind sisterly care this is but a simple wish served on plain soldier's dish these verses which were it must be remembered written by a bulgarian girl in a language not her own were signed by a number of the patients themselves and will ever be to me a precious little document the last few days in the hospital were as can be imagined full of activity stores and equipment had to be checked and packed some for return home some to be given to dr kiranoff and some to dr moloff the president of the bulgarian red cross society who had throughout been like everybody else extremely kind to us requisitioned goods had to be sorted and returned to their respective owners lists had to be made of men who were well enough to be sent back to their regiments and of convalescents who would be sent home and of those who were to be transferred in ox-carts to the barracks hospital the morning of that last day will never be forgotten many of the patients as they were carried on stretchers or helped with crutches to the carts were in tears whilst their more fortunate companions who were going home or back to barracks and also a large crowd of friends sympathizers and onlookers were crowded round the doors of the hospital in the narrow street amidst a scene of enthusiastic handshaking and hand kissings and singing of the shumi maritza the last good-byes were said the remainder of our patients had been lifted into the familiar ox-carts and were disappearing round the last corner of our little street there was one last wave of hands and of crutches projected from under the wicker hoods and the work was over we re-entered the empty hospital to perform the last rites of a work which may it is hoped have been not unserviceable to the cause of the bulgarian nation and to the cause of women florence nightingale showed years ago that women can be of service in hospitals of war and broke through much masculine red tape in the process the women's convoy corps have shown that women can be of use not only in hospitals of war administered by men they have shown that women can without depriving men of their privilege of remaining in the fighting line improvise and administer on their own a hospital of war in all its various departments they did not it is true convoy the wounded from field to base hospital as they were qualified to do the bulgarian military authorities kept this work in their own hands away from foreigners from men and from women alike but the women of the convoy corps convoyed themselves over country which had just been evacuated by the enemy under conditions of difficulty which are not likely to offer themselves frequently for repetition within the continent of europe in modern warfare and testified undoubtedly to the fact that they could as easily have attended en route to wounded soldiers and they endured whatever hardships and privations they may have encountered both on their seven days trek in their subsequent hospital work without harm to themselves and without a grumble and complaint from the first day to the last of the expedition i myself am an old campaigner in africa and elsewhere and no praise can therefore possibly be due to me for qualities of endurance or for my share in the undertaking but i feel it is incumbent upon me to refer to this aspect of the experiment as concerns my companions because it affords the demonstration which was needed of the fact that women can endure stoically and cheerfully and with safety to themselves hardships and privations which being incidental to campaigns of war have been considered only suitable for men it is to be hoped that in future whenever it is thought desirable to send abroad from this country help for the sick and wounded units of women as well as units of men may be dispatched by the b r c s End of chapter twenty two chapters twenty three and twenty four of war and woman by mrs st clair stobart 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three our return journey to sophia was not without interest the railway line though not quite free to adrianople was during the armistice open to demotica and the authorities arranged for us to train through eskibaba to demotica and thence be conveyed in automobiles or failing these in bullock wagons again via karagali to mustafa pasha or karagach where the main line via philippopolis to sophia would be joined the p m o and dr ivanoff and other kindly officials and friends came to the station at kirk Kilis to wish us farewell and after a fourteen hours train journey we arrived at demotica at one a m sleeping quarters had been arranged for us in this picturesque rock townlet but as we were due to leave demotica starting from the station in our automobiles at eight that same morning we elected to remain in our railway carriages in a siding for the rest of the night we procured for breakfast glasses of tea at the station buffet and started in large government automobiles for ourselves and luggage at eight o'clock we reached the halfway house at semlin at one thirty and here we rested and ate luncheon by the roadside we were close to a field hospital and sat near the pathetic little wayside burial ground with its newly dug earth mounds nameless and unmarked mute testimony to the folly of mankind life the only one of man's possessions which he himself is powerless to create the only one of his possessions which he wantonly destroys whilst waiting at semlin delayed after the other cars had started i was fortunate enough to discover that we could by a little deviation from the direct route visit the first line of the bulgarian trenches of investiture round adrianople and yet be in time for our train that night at karagach this would involve a slight risk of being benighted on the bad roads of these bleak moorlands but nothing that is worth doing is accomplished without some risk the order was therefore given to the chauffeur the first line of trenches round adrianople and he started off as obediently as though he had been told to drive us to the parish church in england on a sunday we drew up as we saw the long lines of bulgarian soldiers busy digging and improving trenches which extended along the open country on either side of the road as far as the eye could reach for though the armistice was in progress war as regards preparedness always continues till peace is declared we arrived as the sun was gilding the domes of the four minarets of the beautiful mosque in the besieged city and the whole town in the rays of the setting sun looked so peaceful and fairy-like it was difficult to realize the conditions that prevailed inside the walls we introduced ourselves to some officers who came to meet us and they courteously took us round and showed us how they had gradually advanced their trenches which were visible line after line in the rear of us till now in their present position they were less than three miles from the promised town we were standing on the ridge of an undulating plateau and upon another ridge facing us and within a couple of hundred meters was again a long line of soldiers differently dressed who were also busy digging and improving their entrenchments between us and coextensive with both lines of trenches was a line of white flags placed at intervals those white flags explained our officers betokened during the armistice neutral ground and those soldiers digging on the other side of the flags are turkish soldiers in the first line of defence if war breaks out again the first shots will be exchanged between them and us and he pointed to himself would you asked the officer care to have a talk with some of the turkish officers of course i should and he accordingly sent a messenger inviting his enemies whom to-morrow he might shatter into fragments to come and have a friendly chat we watched our messenger till he reached the top of the opposite slope of the hill and saw him disappear amongst the turkish soldiers for some little time there seemed to be no response nothing happened perhaps they are refusing to come oh no said our officer they'll come we often talk together but when they hear they are to meet ladies they will take a long time arranging their toilettes in the meantime we were shown the large holes which the bulgarian soldiers had dug in the ground for night shelters and i spent a few minutes standing in the trench of this first line of attack trying to picture as i aimed with one of the empty rifles at the enemy opposite what it must be like to be out to kill one's fellow human beings no doubt i should like every one else soon get inured but i felt that henceforth those of us who are not condemned to this inurement should at all costs make their protest 
all around us on both sides of the road and on the road itself enormous holes had been excavated by the shells of the defending guns of adrianople and innumerable fragments of these shells of all sizes as well as empty cartridge cases covered the ground we were kept interested but the toilettes of our turkish friends might cost us our train connection at karagatch and cause us to be benighted and separated from the rest of the party who would await us at the station i was therefore relieved when finally just as it grew dusk we saw striding towards us down the road two medium-sized figures with swords hanging beneath the cover of their long grey cloaks we advanced to meet them and round the white flag of truce on that historic road to adrianople these two turkish officers and our bulgarian officers and our little party of the women's convoy corps met and chatted together in friendliest fashion the turks knew no language but their own but one of our bulgarian officers knew turkish and also french and in this latter language he acted as intermediary interpreting into turkish the remarks i made in french and vice versa for the remarks of the turks to me i broke the ice by telling the turkish officers that we had been conducting a hospital for the wounded and that some of our patients had been turkish soldiers and that they were excellent fellows in red cross work nationalities were non-existent and it was chance only that had directed us to nurse chiefly bulgarians the turkish officers responded in appreciative terms but were obviously weary of the war and looked starved and careworn they wrote their names in turkish characters they knew no other in my notebook and we all turks bulgarians and english talked and even laughed together unrestrainedly we bade them good-bye and as i drove off and watched the two sets of pretended enemies return each to their respective trenches the artificiality of war was borne in upon me these men had no grudge or personal animosity against each other on the contrary they met every day on friendly terms but because the governors of their respective countries are such thick heads so dull of wit or lacking in imagination that they can devise no better way of securing justice these peasant fathers of families are told to dig trenches and play bo-peep till given a signal when they are to dash out and blow each other's brains out the most successful brain-blowers will then be reckoned to have had justice on their side and the world will accept the decision with applause the carnage is given an appearance of seemliness by stage management according to the rules murder is not murder when it is done in line and in obedience to military bugle calls heavens how the devil must needs laugh to see his dupes madly rushing to their work of destruction inspired even to heroic bravery by the specious arguments which he has filled their heads from his trial by water and trial by fire we have already escaped when will his trial by battle also be regarded as an anachronism for twentieth-century mankind and be proscribed and remembered only as a tradition of primeval times when the devil flaunting his naked tail and hoofs was allowed to walk unchidden in our midst war unfortunately did break out again and some if not all of those men with whom we joked and talked are now presumably their jokes all stilled under the sods in those very trenches fools that men are with each life that is born the world gains new brains to help in discovering the mystery of life and of the hereafter but man in his barbarism cries no mysteries for me death is the only thing i can understand i will destroy these brains i will kill and be satisfied a large military and journalistic clack in possession of the big drums and the speaking trumpets then applauds and the rest of us feebly clap our hands in acquiescence until i went to the balkans i had clapped with the majority i had of course never doubted that war is an evil but i had doubted whether there might not be other evils perhaps of a more insidious nature might it not perhaps be true as asserted by the militarists that war brings out qualities of heroism and self-sacrifice which would otherwise lie dormant that the virility of a nation is dependent upon the fighting qualities of its manhood i know now that these are devil's arguments i know now that war kindles not qualities of heroism but qualities of brutality which would otherwise lie dormant atrophied with the dorsal appendage in embryo that war stifles suppresses massacres qualities of essential value for the future of mankind it is true that the virility of a nation is dependent on the fighting qualities of its manhood but the fight which man must wage is not against man but against the environment of man 
that distinguishes man in essence from the brute progress in the world of consciousness is one long fight against environment one long battle against that adaptation to environment which was the leading string of pre-human life i could not succumb to the environment of war all day long in our hospital at kirkulis surrounded on the one hand by the butchered bullocks in the kitchen and on the other by the butchered human beings in the wards the thought was borne in upon me are we then solely animals are bloodshed and butchered bodies the only things that count is there in the world no spiritual element is the religion of christianity only an aspiration are the idealist philosophies of bergson eucken and of those of us who believe in a spiritual future for mankind only an intellectual bubble does man truly believe that his evolution is to be along spiritual lines how then is it possible for him to assert that the only means to the progress of nations is by the butchery of the bodies of his bravest men and the starvation of his women and children is it not time that the world made up its mind as to whether it does or does not believe in this spiritual evolution time that it should boldly face those two small words yes or no there is no third and act straightway in accordance with a decision for those of us who have come to a decision and who believe that the development of mankind will be not upon the physical or the intellectual but upon the spiritual plane our duty lies clear we must acknowledge that war is an unmitigated evil we must denounce the bestial horrors and indignities to which it subjects human beings we must no longer condone war as a tragedy we must condemn it as a crime End of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four our drive in the dark to Karagatch was an exciting race against time but we were fortunate enough to have no punctures or breakdowns and we arrived a few minutes before the departure of the train a military train with special carriages for our party for philippopolis and sophia we arrived next evening at sophia where the red cross authorities under dr radeff's kind direction had arranged for our reception at the hotel de paris for the night the queen had very graciously expressed her wish to see me again i proceeded therefore the next morning to the palace my former impressions of queen eleonora were strengthened and i came to the conclusion that the bulgarian people had been very fortunate not only in their choice of king for his intellectual qualities are well known in europe but in the possession of a queen who combines in a wonderful way a capacity for hard work and mastery of detail with qualities of intuition sympathy and understanding her majesty spoke with much warmth and gratitude of the services rendered to her bulgarian soldiers by the convoy corps she had she said received many reports official and unofficial of the progress of our work in hospital and all alike had been in flattering terms i confided to her my hesitation as to the right moment for closing the hospital and her majesty replied you have chosen exactly the right psychological moment and after some personal encomiums which were particularly undeserved the queen asked me to accept a photograph of herself framed in silver and to deliver to each member of the corps then present with me a gift which she kindly sent to the hotel dr radeff was as usual kindly solicitous for our welfare he must have been overburdened with work and worries but he never fussed and that evening as he accompanied us to the station helped us with our luggage and saw us into our special carriages he with his fine bulgarian courtesy conveyed the impression that for the moment his only concern in life was for our well-being our heavy baggage which had been taken in charge by the station master earlier in the day and placed in a van of its own had disappeared together with the station master a new station-master for the night shift knew nothing of our van-load it will be sent after you he said calmly i beg to differ there were literally thousands of vans and trucks crowding nearly a mile of lines and there was small chance of our truck of luggage and equipment extricating itself all on its own we hunted for the van till it was time for the train to start then i visited the station-master again we are going i said quietly to remain here till you find our luggage we cannot go back to the hotel again please therefore give us some railway carriages in which we can spend the night put us on a siding then search for our van we'll depart and leave you in peace when you have found it this produced a marvellous effect 
we spent the night in unwarmed carriages on a siding and early in the morning before it was light i was aroused from a semi-unconscious condition by hearing something that sounded like an express train coming along our line the word collision was on my lips when a collision occurred crash bang i was hit on the head by my gladstone bag kodak and other articles which had been hurled from the rack above and ricocheted from my head into the passage outside i dashed out to see if any of the others in the other carriages were hurt but found no harm done only a general scattering of the handbags i felt very angry with the station-master and i made for his office for i had warned him against putting us on a siding which was not safe madam he replied quietly it was your luggage anxious to rejoin you the engine driver lost control i am sorry he will be reprimanded but now you can leave at seven o'clock it was with feelings both of regret and satisfaction that we bade farewell to sofia and bulgaria and started on our return journey via belgrade budapest vienna frankfurt brussels calais and dover to london an accident to the orient express of which a portion was smashed to splinters on the main line outside belgrade caused some delay but in due course the women's convoy corps arrived safely back in london having proved by practical demonstration that women can be of independent service in time of war this practical demonstration will it is hoped in a humble way help to convince our old friend of public opinion that it is expedient to employ women in warfare and that the question with which we started this book ought women to take a practical share in national defence and to be included as an integral portion of the territorial army may safely be answered in the affirmative End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of war and women by mrs st clair stobart this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five but even though it may by the foregoing pages have been shown that women are capable of taking a share a serviceable share in warfare without inexpediency to any concerned and even with the direct benefit to all concerned there remain questions of sentiment which must not be ignored if we are thoroughly to satisfy our old-fashioned friend public opinion for we all as mill puts it have sentiments but with some people these are adapted to past ages with others to coming ages and those whose sentiments are adapted to the past rather than the future will be feeling discomfort about many points why they may ask is it necessary that women should come out from their homes to do work like this at all even granting if you like that they can do it and do it well isn't there plenty of good work to be done within their own homes a woman's fear is the home but it must be remembered in answer to this that the conditions of home life have since the days of our grandmothers been revolutionized for women by machinery and factories these accessories of civilization have deprived women of the natural outlet for activities of an industrial and domestic as well as of an intellectual order within the home in the days when such proverbs as the woman the cat and the chimney should never leave the house bonne femme et oiseau de cage a wife and a broken leg are best left at home were current in every household there was some reason why women should remain at home for within the home were conducted by women all the industries of life in those days women not only made jams and pickles cured the hams and bacon concocted wines and medicines they also designed and embroidered all the curtains tapestries and carpets the making of beautiful laces the spinning the weaving the sewing and the knitting of all the garments was committed to the charge of women in those days when the control of all that made life worth living was with women she did not need nor did she seek outside occupations which indeed consisted chiefly of the less intellectual pursuits of hunting and fighting there was plenty of scope within doors for the intellectual industrious and artistic faculties of every active-minded woman if it were true that woman was more honoured at that time when she remained within the confines of the domestic hearth than she is now this was not because she remained at home but because all the arts and crafts of life were in her hands within the home but now all this is changed through no fault of the woman herself and except for the young wife and mother who has plenty of occupation in the rearing of her family there is not enough work within the home for additional active-minded and able-bodied women the unmarried daughters sisters cousins aunts who need occupation but who can have no family of their own because there are not enough men to go round 
the care and cleanliness of the home itself is now in a large measure confined to machinery and automatic cleaners take the place even of the good old annual spring cleaning which gave holiday to husbands and opportunities to housewives the result is that with the best will in the world women who are not wives and mothers and who do not need to earn a living are reduced to finding occupations in futile social functions bridge parties motor driving and flirtations the more energy and activity a woman possesses the more energy and activity will she put into these pastimes and the more seriously she treats these pursuits the worse it is for herself and for the state duty varies with times and circumstances it was recorded as a eulogy of the father of frederick the great that when he met a woman on the street he would walk up to her with his cane raised saying go back into the house an honest woman should keep indoors when the work of a woman was within the home it was obviously the duty of women to be chiefly within doors but now that almost every form of possible work for women has been transferred to regions outside the domain of home it becomes just as much the duty of a woman to go outside and a dereliction of duty to remain within as it was formerly her duty to remain within and a dereliction of duty to be frivolous outside in the human as in the animal world change of environment necessitates change of habit and change of habit involves again change of character for women the whole environment and conditions of life have changed and deprived of her ancient sphere of activity within the sheltered walls of her own household women must now choose between two alternatives she must on the one hand either content herself with tatting dusting china ornaments nursing poodle dogs and giving herself over to a life of fatuous and supersensual emotions degenerate that is into a social parasite sucking the very life-blood of the state or she must seek work in the outer world the example of the kiwi bird should be a wholesome warning to those women who hanker after the first alternative this bird whose natural firmament was celestial space succumbed to the temptation of following a line which was temporarily one of least resistance and because food was at one time plentiful on the ground and exacted less exertion in attainment adapted itself structurally and with apparent temporary advantage to become a ground bird but there came a time when firearms were introduced into new zealand and that poor foolish kiwi bird with its wings now irretrievably atrophied is likely soon to become extinct and women if they do not face the present situation courageously are liable to suffer not extension but degeneration to lose their wings of independence and become parasites depending for the means of livelihood upon the efforts physical and mental of the other sex decadence of all the finer qualities of womanhood must result if women are to be condemned to a life in which love and intrigue games pleasures and social functions are the dominant features and nothing is more certain than this if woman degenerates men's degeneration is not far distant bodies of different weights fall with the same velocity brixen's formula which he applied to science applies it seems with equal appropriateness to the position of woman to-day it is brixen says an immutable law of the universe that species pass through alternate periods of stability and transformation when the period of mutability occurs unexpected forms spring forth in a great number of different directions and might we not expect as a possible contingency that undue suppression of those new forms will result in the production of monstrosities but if woman is to work in the outer world in competition with man who has indeed already annexed most of her former occupations if that is she is to participate with man on equal terms in the general work of life in the rewards of business art trades and the professions and in the benefits of social security and good government she must share with man the responsibility of defending those walks of life and that government from enemies without as well as from enemies within the modern woman has an instinct that there is a large sphere of work open to her in the territorial service of her country when once the sea of prejudice has been safely crossed is she in indulging this instinct more irrational than say columbus who set sail upon an instinct that the atlantic had a shore upon the other side it is difficult to realize that only fourteen hundred years ago in the sixth century a d a council of the wisest men of the day sat solemnly at macon to discuss the question as to whether or no women possessed souls and were human beings like unto men or whether they were indeed merely animals 
by a stroke of good luck for us women the question was eventually decided though only by a small majority in the affirmative only by the skin of our teeth were we recognized by the world as belonging to humanity now one of two things either women must during the intervening period between that council of macon and the time of our grandmothers the time of man's ideal woman have made a most miraculous progress or those men of macon were wrong in their estimate of the nature of women in the former alternative is it not possible that without men's having noticed it women have gone on progressing out of recognition from our grandmother's times to this year of grace nineteen thirteen in the latter alternative if the men of the macon age were so completely out in their estimates of the nature and capacity of women as even to doubt their kinship in humanity with men may not twentieth-century men have perhaps also a little misfocused the attributes of woman it must also be remembered by those who use the sphere of home argument against the participation of women in national defence and work outside the home that twentieth-century methods of quick transit and communication have enlarged for women as well as for men the narrower significance of the word home though the home is still as it probably always will be the centre of a woman's life the word home has now for women an imperial and world-wide import and embraces not merely the few square roods surrounding her home domain but the colonial dominions in which her sons and daughters live a woman's horizon is no longer bounded by her own back parlor and the parish hall but by atlantic and pacific oceans which belong to the human family machinery deprived woman of her ancient sphere of work within the home but machinery in the shape of quick means of transit and communication has now in reparation open for women the portals of the world the result is an extension of woman's sense of responsibility to national and even international concerns woman now sees that there are national as well as domestic virtues and that it is no more desirable in the interests of women that men should have a monopoly of national virtue than it is desirable in the interests of men that women should have a monopoly of domestic virtue what about the interests of men it may be asked is the whole world in future to be conducted in the interests of women only all the best instincts of man revolt against the idea that his womankind should be exposed to the cruder realities of war the woman who can face bloodshed and atrocities and endure hardships without wincing is no longer the woman of man's ideal the charm of womanhood with its delicacy of sentiment and feeling will vanish and the ideal relationship a relationship of contrast between the sexes will be destroyed like does not mate with like besides women will no longer want to marry the dull routine of home life will stand no chance as against the more adventurous possibilities of a life given to the national service but in the first place it must be borne in mind that the strength of character of a nation is in direct ratio to their struggle against nature's obstacles is this truth only applicable to the manhood of the nation may it not also apply to women who so long as they are sheltered and cosseted cannot develop the finer and more heroic characteristics men dislike the hardening process for women but the moral fibre of women and therefore eventually of the nation itself is at stake as concerns marriage if it should indeed be true that women who can find practical work in life outside marriage would no longer be so eager to marry this would not necessarily be an evil for it would probably act as an additional incentive to man to desire marriage marriage has been regarded for women as a profession in which failure involves as in other professions humiliation women are trained therefore under the present regime to employ all the arts at their disposal to ensure success in their profession the greater the number of competing women and the more jaded the inclination of men who are fewer in numbers and can thus pick and choose the more need is there for arts and wiles and sensuous display on the part of women if women were absorbed in professions and occupations such as farming architecture territorial service and the like and only desired marriage when and because they loved the loss in the woman of the wiles and artificialities which formerly stimulated the man to marriage would be counterbalanced by a more healthy emulation on the part of the man who would be desirous to obtain something of value which was difficult to get furthermore is it not as a rule the active and industrious women who shirk motherhood 
but the idle women who concentrate on the pleasure derivable from emotions which were intended by nature only as a means towards an end the history of so-called civilization shows that this end the ultimate object of love-making between the sexes is ignored generally speaking in proportion to the glorification that is given to the means if therefore the attention of women should be distracted from the preoccupations of sexual allurements the result would probably be shown not in a diminishing birth-rate but in a reduction of white slaves amongst women and of sensuous pleasure-seekers amongst men ah but it will be again contended man's instinctive sense of chivalry requires that women shall not defend it is she who must be defended it is the weakness and dependence of women which brings out all the noblest characteristics of man this argument was one day illustrated to me in an interesting fashion by an opponent of this sphere of work for women he was assuring me as a reason why it was undesirable that women should participate in national defence that it should be very bad for the character of man he spoke as follows it is good for men he said that women should retain their feebleness and feminism i like he went on naively to feel when i fondle a helpless kitten on my knee that i could take it and bang its head against the wall i don't do so and therefore the helpless kitten brings out all my best characteristics but if the best characteristics of man can only be developed by the maintenance of the helpless kitten attributes of woman and the atrophy of her finer and more self-reliant qualities then the sooner men and women set to work to devise some other standard of best characteristics both for men and for women the better there is much confusion prevalent on the subject of the sex characteristics of women owing i have always thought to general lack of discrimination between those characteristics of a woman which are incidental to her sex and should be truly called qualities of womanhood and those characteristics which are only incidental to her environment and should be recognized as characteristics of femininity the womanly qualities are those which are essential for the preservation of the species they are concerned with the primary functions of sex itself they have been evolved they are of germ cell origin and are inheritable in that sex only to which by nature they belong they are in short qualities which have been hallmarked by god for creative purposes the instincts of mother-love of self-sacrifice of usefulness these are in women essential for the fulfilment of the idea of the species for without them the race would die these are the inheritable ingrained qualities of womanhood the feminine characteristics on the other hand have not been evolved by god they have been inculcated by mankind for purposes of an artificial social life love of dress and display inanity helplessness and idleness these are not ingredients of the woman's nature they are not instincts they are habits superficial and eliminable femininity exhibited in hobble skirts corsets preposterous headgear and high-heeled shoes is like the blueness of the andalusian fowl described by mendel it is a quality for which in nature there is no gamete man has made woman feminine for his purpose god made her womanly for his the characters of womanhood as also of manhood are unchangeable but if the characteristics of femininity and of masculinity which are dependent upon circumstance and environment do not change with the changes of circumstance and environment caricatures of both sexes are the result and now that a vast change has been effected by machinery factories and methods of transit and communication in the circumstances and environment of woman's life it is inevitable that a change should also take place in those outer characteristics which are however the characteristics of femininity only but it may again be urged such highfalutin philosophy might be good enough for books but let us be practical supposing war breaks out and the woman is called away from her home on active service what is to happen to the poor wretched man who if he were not himself in the army or in the territorial service would be left to servants with the care of the children on his hands and his home life destroyed and what would happen to the children if the man and the woman both went off on service the latter case is immediately answered for no woman with small unleavable children would join the territorials but as regards the possibility of a man being left by wife sister aunt or any other home-making relative it must be borne in mind that in the case of a man similarly called upon to leave his home 
his wife and his family the world thinks it very right that he should in times of national emergency consider the welfare of the nation before the welfare of his family this is a higher morality which is not generally disputed why then should the same high morality not apply equally in the case of woman but it will be argued men do not desire that women should make these sacrifices men are themselves willing to make any sacrifice that is required but it is their privilege to shield their womenfolk from such necessity we all know they say that a woman will sacrifice herself for her home her husband and her child and that is all we demand of her we do not desire or deem it fitting that she should sacrifice her home her husband and her child for her country the supreme sacrifice is the duty and privilege of man but if it is the sacrifice which for the man constitutes the virtue and the heroism why should not the greater sacrifice entailed upon the woman who should leave home and family for work in hospitals of war constitute for the woman an even greater virtue and heroism are women to be denied all exercise in the higher and heroic virtues if it is important for the character of the male population that they should be ready to make sacrifices for their country it is difficult to see how it could be bad for the character of women to make a similar sacrifice it is true that a discrimination between national and domestic virtue may be involved but as illustrated by those who volunteered for the boer war discriminations between patriotic and business claims patriotic and family claims were made by men who volunteered their services and on the whole these discriminations were safely left to the discretion of business men and fathers of families is there any reason to suppose that a woman would more likely reject the claims of family and of home duty than a man if then it be right according to a higher morality for women as well as men to make sacrifices of others than themselves in national causes it cannot be less right for them to do so because there may be accompanying risk women in these days feel that it is no longer desirable for men to decide either whether women shall take risks or what the nature of the risk shall be women are no longer in their nonage they are responsible human beings and are capable of judging for themselves so long as men kept women from a knowledge of life and of its dangers so long as it was incumbent on men to keep them also from the accompanying and unknown risks but from the moment that an adult woman understands the risks she may be running it is for her to determine whether she will take them it will probably be argued in reply that risk of life which men and women both share in common is one thing but there are other risks due to a woman's sex which she would in warfare have to face and that it is from these risks that men would at all costs protect her but the sex of woman runs more risks every night in the civilized streets near piccadilly under conditions of civil law than is ever likely to be encountered by them under martial law there is no danger so great for women as ignorance there is no danger in the outside world or on battlefields which can compare with the danger incurred through the ignorance of the woman who never leaves the sphere of home and again if the sacrifice which the woman makes in leaving her home should involve on the man the sacrifice of losing her the deplorable circumstance will be not the act of sacrifice but the war which makes such sacrifices necessary if disaster to the home should come to be for the man as it has always been for the woman a corollary of war an additional incentive towards peace might thus be provided and woman's entrance into the area of war become on this score alone justified but again it may be urged that the welfare of the state depends upon the welfare of the family which must at all costs be guarded and that the presence of the woman in the home is essential to the welfare of the family but existing laws point to the prevalence of the impression that the husband and father is of more value to the family than the wife and mother and as concerns the material welfare of the home the result is under present conditions probably more disastrous if the man is killed than if the woman dies for whereas the death upon the battlefield of the man the breadwinner may entail the destitution of the family the death of the wife and mother in a fever hospital would cause to the family at home chiefly sorrow and inconvenience in any case it is left to a man's own conscience to decide between his country and his family and a similar decision could probably be left with equal safety to the conscience of women to whom the horrors of war would offer less temptation from the path of home duty than to the man 
it is in any case as important for the character of women that they should be free to choose the form of sacrifice required by the emergency as it is for men and there is no reason to suppose that given the choice the woman's sense of duty to the home would be less acute than that of her male partner there must at any rate be no half measures the woman who derives benefits from the country must be prepared where circumstances permit to serve that country in national emergency and if she engages herself to serve that country she must be ready to make every sacrifice even the sacrifice of her own feelings if the emergency arises and the man who does not want to see the british race die of inanition must sacrifice his feelings and help the woman in their newborn desire to grow a national backbone it is to the interests of men as members of a dominant race that the heroic as well as the gentler virtues should be cultivated amongst women to judge from the numbers of the territorial army to-day there is not a glut of self-sacrificing qualities amongst men the development of a national virtue amongst women might be the salvation of the men and an incentive to a patriotism in which men and women would vie with each other in wholesome rivalry and who knows if when the time should come that men and women should be out together for heroic purposes it might not come to pass that the manhood that has been in war will be transferred to the cause of peace and war will then as emerson predicted lose its charm and peace be venerable to men End of chapter 25chapter twenty six of war and women by mrs st clair stobart this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six but now that the war office has organized through the b r c s a system of voluntary aid detachments in which women are invited to serve and that this scheme has been all over the country largely taken up by women isn't that enough it may be asked but i answer emphatically no this b a d scheme is to my mind worse than nothing for it acts as a placebo a bread pill to dupe women into the belief that they are being treated seriously by the war office if women are to do the real territorial work they must be made a real living portion of the territorial army they must work with and under the organization of the territorial army and not primarily as now under the jurisdiction of a red cross society which is intrinsically an organization for other purposes the duplication of authority is crippling in time of peace it would be fatal in time of war conditions of training must if they are to be of any practical use be military conditions dictated by military authorities women who are to perform national work should be enlisted and paid as men are paid in the territorial army and real work not play work must be exacted by those who understand the kind of work which would be required in military eventualities it is true that at the moment the war office sends a representative to inspect vad's but these representatives pass their verdict according to standards which are hopelessly inadequate and inappropriate to real conditions of warfare the whole thing is a farce a mere drawing-room game conducted upon the principle that women are incapable of anything but amateur nursing more and more stress is laid upon the importance of the linen frock and white apron hospital work on the assumption that the only place for volunteer women in warfare will be within hospital wards but from experience of what i saw and heard in the balkan hospitals other than our own it is precisely within the wards of hospitals that volunteer and amateur women who are untrained and undisciplined are least wanted within the wards trained nurses who have been subjected to discipline not the least valuable portion of their training and who have given up their lives to the work are for many reasons essential volunteer women are wanted to render first aid in every department of work that occurs between the removal of the wounded from the field hospital to their arrival at the base hospital they should certainly be able to render first aid in nursing as in bandaging convoy work cooking and all the branches of work within the area specified but should not be allowed to regard themselves as trained nurses the result in the wards in time of war would be deplorable women who are to be efficient in the territorial sphere must be given opportunities of training and discipline similar to those which are given to territorial r a m c men the triviality of the training the lack of discipline and the haphazardness of the whole v a d scheme as now in practice 
would result in fiasco in time of emergency and the whole cause of woman's work in national service would be seriously prejudiced it is true that a severe and more military regime would probably exclude thousands of women who now proudly rejoice at having obtained medals for attending half a dozen lectures or first aid and home nursing but this elimination is essential to serious work there are at the moment thousands of women on the v a d registers who would be a grave hindrance to real work in time of emergency as long as they are allowed to play around in the movement so long will the movement be a mockery of the aspirations of earnest and capable women it would be far better for the nation to have at command a few hundred trained and disciplined women upon whom in emergency reliance could be placed than to permit hordes of undisciplined women to be registered as members of v a d s and to regard themselves as fully qualified without discrimination as to capacity and training to take positions of responsibility in time of war i plead that women who are seriously desirous of joining the territorial army as workers should be allowed to form a supplementary army medical corps of women to act in conjunction with the r a m c of men and to be subject to the same authority as the men is it not a suggestive thought for those who still doubt the capacity of women to do this that or the other thing which has hitherto been done only by men that throughout the whole range of chemistry similarity of arrangement means similarity of property the properties of the atoms are dependent on the arrangement of the corpuscles of which they are composed it is not the intrinsic quality or size or weight of the atom but arrangement which gives character whatever may be the difference in the comparative weights of respective atoms there will be similarity of property if there is similarity of arrangement in the corpuscles of which they are composed is it unreasonable to assume that the differences between the characters of men and of women respectively is due chiefly to the differences of arrangement or of training which they undergo there is little if any of the work which is at present being performed by the men of the r a m c which could not be done by women and even though the authority should still wish to prevent women from coming on to the actual field of battle there is plenty of other r a m c work which could still be accomplished by women so long as there is a shortage in territorial numbers it is wasteful to draw off able-bodied men from the fighting line to do any work which could be done by women the summation however of the whole argument is this the changed conditions of women's life have forced her from the narrow circle of her own home to the broader arena of the outside world here she has to compete for a livelihood with man in the business arts trades and professions of life but it is clear that if woman is to share with man the advantages of a government which protects her industries and means of livelihood she must share with man in the responsibility of defending that government from foes without as well as from foes within the question as to whether woman should share in the government of her country is a part of the woman question which we are not here dealing but it is in any case transparent that the duty of participating in the defence of a country follows as a corollary to participation in work and benefits provided by that country if however woman is to defend the country in a serviceable way as a duty and not a game she must be seriously trained not only in the work but also in the discipline which the proper conduct of the work demands and if she is to be trained and disciplined and thus made of practical service to the country she must be rewarded as men are rewarded by pay and titles and ranks which are recognized in the territorial army as the rewards for definitely recognized work her work would then be a national service and should be under the same control as the national service of men the energies and activities formerly contributed by women to the work conducted within the home needs appropriating and channeling if it is not to bring disaster to the community could there be a more serviceable aqueduct for the surplus activity of those seriously minded women who are now at a loose end than employment in the territorial service of their country it is now hoped that the practical demonstration which the women's convoy corps have given in the balkans of the capacity of women to be of independent service and to endure practical difficulties in the sphere of war without hindrance to others or harm to themselves may help if only in a humble way to convince our old friend public opinion of the expediency of answering in the affirmative the question with which we started this book ought women to take a practical share in national defence and to be included as an integral portion of the territorial service.
he who wishes to cling to the old that ages not must leave behind him the old that ages may i then in conclusion ask those who base their opposition to women's participation in the more active work of the outer world and who still cling to their time-worn fetish a woman's fear is the home to remember that the women who desire to serve their country are not as a rule the women who neglect they are on the contrary the women who would defend their homes they have no desire to relinquish their old ideal of being the guardian angels of the home but they now regard home in the larger sense of country and of empire and desire to be allowed to share with man the larger morality of the larger term if the men who are in authority at the war office and elsewhere would learn to distinguish between women and femininities they would not be afraid as to the result of this new desire on the part of women they would then understand the significance of the old freulian saying what the woman wanteth god wanteth and what god wanteth cometh to pass end of chapter twenty six end of war and women by mrs st clair stobart recorded by celine major